right, so it looks like we have a good number of attendees. Um, as everyone else continues to join, um, let me go ahead and introduce myself. My name is Sarah, and I'm going to be acting as a moderator and host for this webinar. Um, I wanted to thank everyone for registering and for attending. We are very lucky to have Elizabeth Gregory as our presenter. She is an attorney at Johnson Law Group, and um, she is going to talk to us a little bit about common law marriage. So I'm going to go ahead and let her take it away and share all of her knowledge with us. All right. Thank you so much, Sarah. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Sarah mentioned, my name is Elizabeth Gregory. I'm a partner here at the Johnson Law Group. And the presentation today is on common law marriage. So let me share my screen. All right, Sarah, can you let me know? Can you see my screen? Yes, and it looks great. Thank you. All right, so we're discussing common law marriage today. Uh, the question is, are you married? There are two different ways to be married in Colorado. Um, the first way is the statutory way where you have a certificate of marriage. It is signed by both spouses and two witnesses and you file it uh, with the recorder's office. Um, that is the, the, when you think of getting married and having a valid marriage, that is what most people normally think of. Um, however, in Colorado, Colorado is one of the few states in the United States that recognizes common law marriage where if parties engage in certain conduct, um, that can be demonstrative of being in a, a marriage without filing the marriage license or the marriage certificate. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. Before we dive into the presentation, I have to let everyone know that this presentation is not legal advice. Um, we appreciate your attendance and listening to the presentation, uh, but the attendance on this webinar presentation um, does not make an attorney-client relationship and should not be construed as legal advice. All right. So... If you haven't filed the marriage license or marriage certificate, and you think that you're married, how do we determine that? Well, the court utilizes a two-factor test. First, the two people mutually consent or agree to enter into the legal and social institution of marriage. And then after that agreement, they engage in conduct manifesting the mutual agreement or in non-legal jargon uh, did the two of you agree to be married and then did you act like you were married now it's very important to define this type of relationship it has to be a marital relationship um, the court just issued a, uh, an opinion on a case um, earlier this year uh, defining this and further giving us guidance. Did the two of you intend to enter a marital relationship to share your life together as spouses in a committed, intimate relationship of mutual support and obligation? So this is different than boyfriend, girlfriend, significant other, cohabitation, um, you know, simply living under the same roof. It is the intent to enter a marital relationship. Keeping in mind that a marital relationship can look different for a lot of people. It's another thing that we'll talk about uh, in a little bit. So how do we determine the intent to enter a marital relationship? 
the court is going to look at a bunch of different factors to determine this. Um, none of these factors are dispositive. <coughs> Excuse me. None of these factors are dispositive, meaning not a single one of them will uh, make or break your case or the existence of one of them or the lack of existence of one of them is not going to make a significantly huge impact overall. The court is going to take the totality of the circumstances. The court's going to take everything into consideration when determining whether or not the parties entered into a common law marriage. So, sorry. The first one, or one of them, I said the first one. These are not in any particular order. I should be clear on that. Reputation. Do other people think that you're married? Does your family think that you're married? Do your friends think you're married? Do your coworkers think that you're married? Do your friends, family, coworkers, do they call your significant other uh, your spouse, your husband, your wife? Um, or do they refer to that person as your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your significant other, your partner? Um, and some people actually call their, their spouse their partner. Um, so that's not necessarily a determining factor either. Um, but do, do the people in your life think that you are married? Um, that ties into the next one. Do the two of you hold yourself out as being married? Do you refer to each other as husband, as wife, as significant other, as spouse? Um, as boyfriend, girlfriend, as partner, um, if, if you refer to each other as boyfriend, girlfriend, significant other, that would indicate that you do not believe that you are married um, because you're not referring to the other person as your spouse or your husband or your wife. Um, this includes um, documentation as well. Um, when you fill out your medical forms at your doctor's office, do you indicate your um, emergency contact as your spouse, as your husband, as your wife, or do you indicate your emergency contact is your sister, um, meaning you, you don't have a significant other? Um, on your insurance documents, do you indicate that you have a spouse? Um, do you have your spouse covered under your insurance, whether that's health insurance, car insurance, um, that type of thing? Um, cohabitation. Do you live together? Now, this is one specifically that the court discussed in the most recent case, which is Hogstead, um, which we're going to talk about in the next slide. Cohabitation is not dispositive. Um, in heteronormative and um, traditional marriages, spouses usually cohabitate. And that was previously um, generally thought of by the court as a dispositive indicator uh, for common law marriage. However, the court has recently recognized in the Hogstead case that um, a lot of people can live together and not intend to be married. Um, that is happening more frequently as society is changing, and that is no longer a dispositive factor regarding um, the decision, the determination of whether a relationship is a common law marriage. It's just a factor that the court considers along with everything else. Um, other factors, joint bank accounts or credit cards, whether both of your names are on the account or if one party's name is on the account and uh, the other's isn't, but the other person has access to the account or is an authorized user on the account or has their own card for the account, can deposit or withdraw from the account. Um, those would be indicators of common law marriage. Um, did you jointly purchase property together? Uh, did you both put money down on your new house? Um, even if one or the other of your names is not on the title, did you both contribute monetarily to it? Um, 
did you both monetarily contribute to a car or uh, a boat or are, do you both contribute to the payment of the lease uh, for your apartment? Um, tying into the next one, joint ownership of property. This does contemplate title or uh, whose name is on the deed or whose name is on the lease or for a car whose name is on the title. Um, if both parties' names are on that document, it is a indication of common law marriage. Uh, but it's not um, it's not going to break the case if that's not uh, if that both names are not on the document. Um, one party taking the last name of the other uh, that would be indicative of common law marriage. Or if uh, the name is hyphenated with the last names, or if it is um, a combin a, a new last name that is a combination, a, a made up combination of the, of the two last names, that would be an indicator as well. Um, filing joint tax returns, indicating uh, married filing jointly on your tax returns, that would be an indicator of common law marriage. Um, having children together. Now, this one is a little bit tricky because we know that a lot of people have children and are not married. So this is not, uh, again, this is not uh, dispositive. This is not uh, a make or break your case factor. It simply um, is something that the court would take into consideration, especially if the two of you had children together and continued residing together as, as a family, um, that would be a strong indicator of common law marriage, but again, not dispositive. Um, the court's gonna look at, at everything, at all of the factors. Um, do the two of you wear rings or other representations of commitment to one another? Uh, and is there a date on which the two of you agreed that you were married? Um, you know, on this date, you were married. Prior to this date, you were engaged or you were not married. And then after the date of marriage, you are married and you are spouses. Um, that is a very big indicator of the common law marriage. Um, and do you celebrate that date every year? Do you celebrate your anniversary? Um, is the other party going to agree that you're married? There has to be a meeting of the minds. Now, of course, the issue of whether or not there's a common law marriage is not going to go before a judge unless there's a disagreement. Um, so that obviously is not a dispositive factor. Uh, but if there is evidence written or, or recording that at one time the other party agreed that you were married, then that's going to be very strong in, the, uh, in favor of a common law marriage. Now, all of these factors are from the case People versus Lucero. And as I briefly mentioned before, this has been abrogated by the Hogstead case earlier this year in 2021. Um, and we'll talk about what that means on the next slide. Um, essentially, as I had said before, all of these factors are important, but none of them is going to make or break your case. They are all going to be put into uh, the basket of evidence um, that the court is going to look at in totality, looking at all of the factors to determine if under the circumstances, there is a common law marriage in existence here. All right, so what did Hogsett say? Factors relevant to common law marriage, so those are the previous factors we looked at on the other slide, they must be assessed in context and inferences to be drawn from the party's conduct may vary depending on the circumstances. So what Hogsett realized and contemplated was that the factors are very heteronormative. And the question in Hogsett was, can a same-sex relationship be a common law marriage? And the answer was yes, it can be. Um, and it's going to be assessed in the context and inferences are gonna be drawn from the party's conduct and it's gonna depend on the circumstances. And that is, um, 
That's the guidance that we have now by the court. Um, we take all the factors into consideration and you have to look at it in, conduct, in context and uh, it's gonna depend on the circumstances. Again, it clarified that cohabitation is not a dispositive factor. So if you're worried right now that you live with your girlfriend or boyfriend and you're scared that it could be considered a common law marriage, unless the two of you have decided that you're married, it's probably not going to be. But if you have any questions, please give us a call. Um, also, having shared biological or genetic children is not necessarily an indicator of marriage. It's also not a requirement of marriage, nor is it uh, the lack of children um, an indicator of non-marriage. Married people can not have children if they don't want to. Um, Non-married people can have children. Um, we, we see that plenty. Um, so it's not a requirement and it's not uh, dispositive of determining whether or not there is a marriage. So what's interesting, I think, um, are the, the factors that the Hogsett Court looked at. Um, so the, the Colorado Supreme Court did not determine whether or not a common law marriage existed. Um, the the court sent um sent the case back down to the trial court and told the trial court to do a better job of of analyzing essentially so um the court noted that there were factors evidencing that a marriage existed and there were also factors indicating that a marriage did not exist so the evidence that the marriage existed, um, the, the two women uh, exchanged custom wedding rings at a bar. They cohabitated and they bought their custom home together. They had joint banking and credit accounts. They went to a financial advisor to manage and preserve their assets as a couple. And they jointly filed the petition for dissolution of marriage. Um, there were also, as I said, a lot of factors um, indicating the marriage did not exist, that there was not a meeting of the minds and they did not intend to develop or form a marital relationship. Um, the, the two women never celebrated the date of their ring exchange as an anniversary. They did not wear their rings consistently. They never referred to each other as wife or spouse. Um, this next one that's on the slide, I, I don't quite understand why the court made a point of this. Um, they did not hide the nature of their relationship for fear of disapproval or discrimination. I don't know why the court noted that as evidence the marriage did not exist, um, but they did. Um, very telling though was one partner's testimony that she filed for dissolution because of her lawyer's bad advice. Uh, that she would not have filed for dissolution uh, had it not been for bad advice of that specific lawyer. Um, so the court sent it back down to the trial court to uh, do a better job of analyzing and determining whether or not a common law marriage existed um, between uh, the two women in this case. So now that we've talked about the factors, why would you even want to allege that there's a common law marriage. Um, what benefit is there? Um, are there any costs? The answer is yes, there are benefits and yes, there are costs. And it, determine, it depends on um, the financial situation of the parties. In order to understand this a little bit more fully, we have to talk about marital property and how marital property is uh, determined. Um, what is marital property? What items uh, that the parties own are considered marital property? And if it is considered marital property, what happens to it when you get divorced? So all of the stuff that the two of you acquired during the marriage, so this includes assets like bank accounts, um, you know, paychecks, uh, 401k, dividends, stocks, bonds, uh, property, so a house, other real estate, uh, personal property like vehicles, boats, horses, dogs, cats, other pets, um, 
debts, so credit cards, loans, um, increases in equity. So if the home was purchased prior to marriage and then the two of you were married, uh, the marital property is the increase in equity of the home during the marriage. Why does this matter? All marital property is subject to the equitable distribution between spouses upon the dissolution of marriage. This means that regardless of title, whose name it's in, whose name's on it, or who owns it, or who purchased it, if it was acquired during the marriage, it is marital property. And equitable distribution upon the dissolution of marriage, that essentially means each person is going to get half when you get divorced. So what are the benefits and the costs or the pros and cons? And I'm going to use some examples for this. So a benefit potentially, if you are a spouse who stays at home with the kids while the other spouse works and financially supports the family, your work is valued in that you'll likely get half of the assets when the marriage is dissolved, even if you didn't contribute monetarily. Additionally, if your spouse controlled the finances and didn't allow you access to the bank accounts, and so you had to put a whole bunch of stuff on credit cards, um, your debts will be split in half with the other spouse as well. So they will be responsible for paying half of that. On the flip side, I'm sure you can imagine the, the costs or the cons to this as well. If you are a spouse who has a steady, stable job and you provide financial support and income to the other spouse uh, while the other spouse uh, mooched off of you, didn't have a job, didn't contribute in any way, it's likely that half of the assets are still gonna go to the other spouse upon the dissolution of marriage. Um, on the flip side of the other example, if the other spouse racked up credit card debts without you knowing, you'll likely still have to pay for half of that debt because it's going to be considered marital property. So let's talk about the process. First, you file the petition for dissolution of marriage just as you would in a, a dissolution of marriage where there's a marriage license or certificate. And this is the process when the person who is filing the petition um, is alleging the common law marriage. So the person alleging the common law marriage still files the petition for dissolution of marriage. And then the other party after 21 days, or the other party has 21 days to file a response. That response may contest the existence of the marriage and say, no, there is no date of marriage. There's no location of marriage because we are not married. The other spouse might also file a motion to dismiss the petition stating that the marriage doesn't exist. Then prior to moving forward with the dissolution proceeding, the court will have to set a hearing on the existence of the marriage. This is a hearing where both parties will present evidence uh, to attempt to show the factors that were listed at the beginning of the presentation in favor of their position. So the person alleging the common law marriage would show that um, the parties had joint bank accounts, they cohabitated, uh, they held themselves out as husband and wife, other people thought they were husband and wife or spouses or husband, husband, wife, and wife. Um, they, they will present as much evidence as possible uh, that would uh, support the existence of the common law marriage. Um, conversely, the spouse who is contesting the common law marriage uh, would present evidence to the contrary. Um, they didn't live together. They didn't call each other spouses. Nobody thought that they were married. They didn't have any joint property. They didn't have any joint bank accounts. They don't have any kids. Um, if the court determines after the hearing that the marriage exists, then the case will proceed as normal, meaning 
it's going to be a dissolution of marriage. You're going to have to set an initial status conference. Uh, mandatory financial disclosures will be required. You will have to attend mediation. And if uh, mediation does not result in agreement, then you'll have to proceed to a permanent orders hearing, which is the trial on the matter. If the court determines after the hearing that a marriage does not exist, the case will be dismissed and nothing else will happen because a marriage doesn't exist. Um, that is, in a nutshell, uh, common law marriage. Um, Sarah, have you received any questions from anyone so far? I actually do have one. Um, I do have the question, can a same sex couple be considered in a common law marriage? And the answer to that is yes. Um, that is uh, specifically from the um, Hogsett case. Uh, same sex couples can be in a common law marriage, yes. Perfect. And just a reminder to all of the attendees, if you guys have any questions, they are anonymous and you can just type them into your chat box and I will read them out to Liz. So that way you will remain anonymous. Um, as always, the participation will be anonymous throughout this entire time. So feel free to put any questions in the chat box. Okay, we actually have another question. Awesome. Um, can someone younger than 18 enter into a common law or common law marriage? That is a really good question. And I think the age of consent for marriage in Colorado is 16. I don't know specifically though. Um, that is a really good question that I would have to specifically research. I do think the age of consent in Colorado is 16 for marriage, which means if it's um, younger than 16, then the parents of the uh, minor would have to uh, consent to the, uh, to the marriage. Um, so if we're between 16 and 18, if 16 is the age of consent for marriage, which I think it is, um, then yes, the answer would be yes, uh, they could enter into a common law marriage. Great, thank you. Um, another question, what is the process for a marriage that is found not to be valid, but there are still assets that need to be divided? That would be an action for replevin. And our firm does not do replevin actions, um, but essentially it would, uh, depending on how much the property is worth, you could file an action in a small claims court, um, or it would be um, a civil action to divide the property. Great, thank you. Um, I'll let you guys, I'll give you guys a few more seconds to type your questions in. These are really great questions, so thank you so much. Okay, we have another one for you, Liz. Um, can I enter into a common law marriage if I'm already married but separated? And the answer to that is no. Um, that would be considered bigamy. Uh, if you are not yet divorced um, from your first spouse and you enter into a marriage with another spouse, um, that is bigamy and it's a class five felony in Colorado. Um, if you know that you are married and you enter into another relationship and consider yourself to be married, um, the, it would be highly suspect. Um, I don't know of anyone who could logically argue that they think they can get married again before they are divorced officially that would be a really difficult argument to make. Yeah, I wouldn't want to make that argument. <laughs> Thank you, Liz. So I'm not seeing any more questions coming in, but um, 
everyone will receive a follow-up email after the webinar. Oh, we actually do have another question. Could you get in trouble for insurance fraud if you have your spouse on your insurance, but the court finds you are not married? I'm not an insurance attorney, but that definitely sounds like insurance fraud to me. So I would suggest not doing that because that sounds like lying. Thank you, Liz. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> These questions are hard. Well, so everyone that is asking questions, thank you so much. And, you know, the purpose of these webinars is so that, you know, everyone can ask their questions to an attorney that is knowledgeable. Um, you can reach out at any time. Um, the email, um, it's info at johnsonlgroup.com is how you can reach us. And you can ask us any questions following the webinar. Um, I would also encourage everyone to like and follow us on social media. We post a lot of very helpful articles on there. And we also have some more upcoming webinars with Liz, actually, um, that I would encourage everyone to attend because that's another great opportunity for you to ask um, any of your legal questions and hear from an experienced attorney. Um, so if we don't have any other questions, um, I think that we can conclude this webinar but you all will be receiving a follow-up email that has links to um, how you can contact us, uh, all of our social media accounts and everything like that. And we hope to see you at our future webinars. Uh, thank you so much, Liz. Appreciate you doing this. Thank you, Sarah. I appreciate it. And thank you to everyone who asked the difficult questions. <laughs> <laughs> all right, have a great day, everybody. Thank you, Sarah.